Okay, hey, hello everyone. Today's topic is quantum computing. Um, quantum computing is set to revolutionize computing and is a topic that I've covered in a number of my books. Uh, in, in my book, Tech Trends and Practice, it's one of those 25 technology trends that I believe will transform the future of, of our world. And to discuss this topic today, I am very pleased to say I'm joined by Lawrence Grassman, who is uh, the founder and president of the of, of Inside Quantum Technology. And you have authored many industry analysis reports on many aspects of quantum computing. So welcome, Lawrence. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me, Bernard. It's such a pleasure. Where are you joining us from today? Uh, Crozet, Virginia. And you've never heard of Crozet, Virginia, but we're right I, near we're right near Charlottesville, Virginia, which is the University of Virginia. Very good. And and so what do you do today? How do you spend your, your day in, in, in your work? Um, well, I'm the president of IQT Research and also of Inside Quantum Technology. Inside Quantum Technology puts on several conferences a year related to quantum computing and quantum sensors and quantum networks and quantum, uh, what did I need? Uh, quantum cybersecurity, of course, you mentioned that. Uh, I run the division, which actually is the IQT research, uh, put out uh, business analysis reports on most of the things I just mentioned, but a little bit more fine tuned. Um, my organization also does several other things in which I have minimal involvement. Uh, we have a daily news sheet, uh, news site, I should say, um, and podcasts and other things, but all focused on uh, quantum technology and where it's headed. We've been in this business for uh, a little over four years, I think. So. Very good. So maybe we can start with the, the most important question of what is, what is quantum computing? So there's two ways of looking at there's two important aspects of quantum computing, perhaps three. Um, everybody knows that in regular, they should know, that in every um, in regular conventional classical computer, we deal in ones and zeros or um, yeses and nos or yeses and nots or, or whatever, and that you can uh, categorize uh, well-defined information in ones and zeros or yeses and all the other things I said. Uh, and then they have to be processed by a computer. In quantum computing, you use uh, something called a qubit instead of a bit. Ones and zeros are called bits. In quantum, it's qubits. And they're continuous. Um, it's not just ones and zeros. It's one, zero, and everything in, behind, in the middle. And jumping forward about 50 chapters in a textbook, that means you can process a lot more information in a, on a quantum computer. Uh, and what that means is that you can do some problems much, well, you can do some problems much faster than problems you do on a classical computer. And sometimes that matters. It's not just, oh, whoopee, I can do this inside of two hours instead of, instead of two days. It's whoopee, I can do this in two hours instead of nine million years. Um, and for most practical purposes that I'm aware of, nine million years, I'm not exaggerating how long some problems would take to solve in a classical computer. Um, that's a big improvement. So there's a whole class of problems, or actually more accurately, a whole class of um, uh, well, there's a class of classes of problems, I suppose, that could be potentially solved with a quantum computer that cannot be. And what's interesting is that includes a lot of practical problems that you might actually want to solve. The second thing I should mention is that, well, it's all very nice to do kind of theoretical mathematical logic on all of these you know, ones and zeros or a continuous range of um, numbers but you also have to embody it in something real. I mean, you know, you, we're talking to each other on a computer and as far as I can see, uh, it consists of, or mine's a Mac, so it consists of one big display with enough room, enough room to put the processors in and the processors are silicon. In um, 
quantum computer, uh, they may well be silicon or some other semiconductor and often are, but we've yet to reach a point where we really know how we're going to embody our quantum computers um, uh, in, I mean, what kind of material we're going to embody computers. So we're sort of, we're sort of where classical computing was in, I don't know, actually the fifties or something when we hadn't quite settled on silicon, uh, except that the range of options for quantum computing is, is really vast. I mean, it includes biological things. It's, it's a, um, it's a fascinating subject because of that alone, I think. Very good. So, how does it work in practice then? Because um, what we're doing is you, you, you're leveraging the phenomena that we only see at a subatomic level. Um, there's some technical challenges around cooling them at the moment. So do you want to go into this? For yeah. And a quick uh, overview? Yeah. So um, again, you know, jumping forward 50 chapters in that book I mentioned, um, we don't know what it's all going to end up like. Uh, at least one technology for quantum computing, which is actually MRI, like in MRI scans, has proved not to be successful um, for that anyway, but um, obviously successful in other ways. And it's most probable that some of the ways that are being explored, I haven't counted the ways, but I'm guessing it's about seven or eight different ways now. Uh, anyway, um, some of those will probably drop out more than one will probably stay in place. So uh, at the moment, um, say IBM's computer, uh, quantum computer, it has to be super cooled. You mentioned that, uh, which adds a lot of cost to it. They look very pretty, by the way. If you go on IBM's page or Rigetti's page, you'll see these things that look like huge chandeliers and it's worth looking at. Um, but, uh, Cooling is not only expensive in the immediate sense, it also takes up, I mean, what used to be a bedroom and is now my office, and I doubt I could get one of those in here, um, but I'm not trying. Uh, then there are other kinds of computers, and, and um, one, for instance, IonQ is using, is based on ions. You don't need to cool them down tremendously. Um, uh, and they, but they work slower than IBM's, you know, or anybody else's super cool computer, but maybe it's good enough for certain applications. IonQ has talked about putting it in a data center where it would have, you know, where it would serve a different role as a, a mega server rather than a, you know, a new form of supercomputer. So maybe different kinds survive. There's another kind, um, called Quanta has one uh, that work on uh, atom at atomic interactions, which of course by definition is not subatomic. Um, uh, and we have other things that are, uh, aren't really that past uh, being in a lab, like um, diamond, uh, faults in diamond can be exploited to do quantum computing. But those, and if I thought really hard, I could think of another three or four more that fall into that category, but they really are on the desk of some lab. And, you know, maybe someday we'll be saying of those kind of things, gosh, they, all those were just on the lab table, but now we know that's the way to go. Or we may be saying, really, uh, did they really do that? We don't know. We're at, at a very early stage. And by the way, the good news, well, the bad news about that is obvious because whatever money's going into, you're taking a, a big bet. Um, the good news is that the potential for breakthroughs are enormous. I mean, if you look at what's happening in the classic semiconductor processor area, there's not much room for, for breakthroughs, really. Um, you know, I could forecast where we're going to be in five years' time, and I bet I'm pretty much right, because it's, <laughs> it's not quite linear, but almost. Um, so um, all of those things are kind of trying to shape up at the moment. Uh, and we'll see how that all all develops. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's early on. At the same time, the promise is huge because instead of processing things sequely in one and zeros, we can use quantum computing to sequence lots of things simultaneously, which 
in theory can give us computing speed that is a trillion times faster than than what we have today so have you what problems can quantum computers solve that that ordinary computers today or even supercomputers today can't solve well the problem is always not so much that they can't solve it as it takes you know such a long time into the future that everybody who started on it will be dead which <laughs> is makes for a good plot in a science fiction movie but uh, probably in anywhere else um so it's pro probably also fair that for various reasons you say could potentially solve because at this point the only problems that we've been able to come up with that can't be solved by a classical computer in any reasonable way but can be solved by a uh, a quantum computer are artificial problems. I mean, what I said about them are true in the terms of their solvability, but at the same time, um, uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't help you in the practical world. The ones that probably have much most potential um, are, uh, well, first I'd say in very large banks, um, if you, we have a, a study somewhere, um, that says, uh, uh, that looks at the number of things that you could do with a quantum computer. And it's amazing how many you can. Now we're still a long way from really doing that practically, not just because of technical problems, but if you're a big corporation, so you're Ford Motor Corporation and you have, you're giving, I don't know, Goldman Sachs a billion dollars to look after. Do you really want to leave it in the hands of some newfangled computer? Answer no. So a certain level of trust is going to have to be established in this technology. But all these big banks now have, and I do mean the very biggest, not you know, your local bank or even if it's quite big, have their own quantum teams now exploring what can be done in the next five to ten years, let's say. And they're looking at trading, uh, more effective trading, at portfolio analysis, that kind of thing. The second group is really two groups, um, and that's uh, designing materials. Um, and uh, that's because to design materials, we, excuse me, we sort of um, look at uh, what um, uh, needs to be done with some very complex molecules um, and we can model those but then we can't work with them um, and so a quantum computer gives that potential and one um, application would be just material science you know are, are we designing can we design the, the strongest polymer possible that would be even stronger than aluminum and steel for for an aircraft never catches fire um, you know you can make it up as you go along too uh, and then can you um, different field but essentially same problem can you design the latest and greatest diabetic drug um, I'm a diabetic so I I'm biased here but that would be nice uh, mm. maybe something that would cure you um, who knows uh, I mean I'm not trying to make this into you know a magic technology um everybody would still be different and there'd still be um you know different doses for different people that were applicable and you could actually use a quantum computer to come out with um you know, drug um, delivery systems that were better uh, but again everyone's different and i don't know that we're anywhere near being able to run that through a quantum computer um, so those are the two that I always think about. Any kind of optimization problem um, has already been, well, any kind of optimization problem that's complex is often uh, a subject for using a quantum computer. So there's the um, a, a traveling salesman problem, which you probably come across, which essentially says, I mean, the nice thing about it is it sounds very easy. So this guy, the, poor salesman has to go to all these towns and the point about it is there's quite a few and um for some psychotic reason he's not allowed to go through the same town once so you have to come up with some kind of way of 
of working out uh, what that is. And it turns out the only way you're really going to be able to do that is to run through all the possibilities. And if you do the basic, very basic high school math on that, it's some unbelievable number. Uh, you can't do it with a regular computer. You can at least approximate to it with a quantum computer. So you could do those kind of problems. Well, I don't think anybody's ever going to do that except in a, a math periodical. Um, there's plenty of problems that are sort of like that. Um, and there's a little bit of a more of a history there. So a company called D-Wave, and there are machines like this in Japan. I think Fujitsu has one, or NEC has one. Um, called annealers, and they're not quite quantum computers. Um, and again, it's another one of those subjects that you can argue about when's a computer, not a computer. Um, but annealers can do these optimization problems really well. Um, and they're probably, and even D-Wave thinks this, um, you know, it was a way to get into quantum computing um, very early. Uh, and we're going to real quantum computers now, but there's a little bit of a history of people trying optimization. Uh, Volkswagen, I think, um, did, um, you know, looking at traffic patterns, which mat matter to them for obvious reasons, um, in several cities around the world. Uh, one of them was Shanghai, I think. Uh, maybe it was Beijing, I don't remember. Um, looked at traffic patterns and how you could manage those better for more optimal use of uh, of driving for of drivers so that's probably another one um you mentioned global warming um or climate change or um that's certainly uh, a possibility uh, modeling very complex situation isn't that i mean the topic's obviously very different but to to traffic movements um it, it, I would remind people, though, with all of these things, you still got to build the model, um, and that's a whole different skill set, uh, and and very complex when you're dealing with it. But yeah, I mean that would be, um, and medical stuff rather than pharmacological stuff is is another one you could build a theoretical model of the heart and test things out and that kind of thing. A lot of those, though. Um, exist there's certainly work going on on climate change that's for sure but if you look at what is mostly going on it's either very specifically optimization or stuff in material science or pharma or stuff in the financial world i don't know what percentage all of those added together uh, are of uh, quantum applications but i bet it's a big chunk mm. um, um yeah so from for me is if you look at the the, the areas where high performance computing is used at the moment, oh, like okay. weather predictions, like predicting really complex patterns, like the, the traffic flow in, in entire cities, um, like synthetic biology, medicine, material science, gene technology, all of these things are, are potential applications, I guess, for quantum computing. Absolutely, and these will change. I mean, if we have a, this conversation in three years, this part of the conversation, well, actually everything we said will change by then in important ways. But I bet you right, the applications look a bit different then, as, as will the, the technologies. So today we, sometimes people think, hey, I haven't got a quantum computer, I can't build one because they, they are very expensive. I, I guess the vision of companies like IBM, Google, um, Microsoft, Fujitsu, uh, some of the companies are, are building their own quantum technology is that you can simply access this as a service, a bit like how we access cloud computing today. Is this what you see in the future? Well, yes and no. So maybe the best example there is, is IBM because they probably have more working quantum computers than anyone else. I hope I don't get something thrown at me for saying that, but I think it's true. They have something like 30 out there and they have them in a network and you can access them. I mean, uh, if you're a student and you want a couple of minutes on it, they'll basically give it to you. Or they would two years ago. I'm not actually sure what they do now. If you want bigger use, they, I mean, I know Exxon has 
uh, oil and gas is another area that's interested in it. But I know Exxon is, is, I think, is a customer of IBM. Could be wrong about that too. But then they obviously have to pay, which is the idea. They do go over a network. Uh, interestingly, it's a uh, pretty much a, a standard digital cloud network, but it's got some features that make it suitable for accessing a quantum computer. That will change as well. But um, but you can't buy a quantum computer. Uh, yeah. Uh, Cle Cleveland Clinic has an IBM quantum computer. Um, uh, uh, there's one in Japan too, um, and I think it's one of their research institutes. So some people will do that. Uh, my expectation is um, that there will be a trans. If you remember the old days, I'm not saying you do remember the old days, but um, the uh, we went from uh, mainframes and supercomputers to mini computers, uh, which was still pretty darn big, but they um, weren't that big. And instead of costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, they cost $50,000. So suddenly smaller firms could buy the $50,000 computer, a mini computer. Um, when I was at high school, they took the math graduates out to some university in London and um, they showed us a mainframe and we programmed in Fortran on a, on a card and it was the size of this house. I mean, and, and, and I don't live in a small house. Um, uh, then by the time I got to business school, uh, uh, seven or eight years later, um, we were on minis. But of course, a $50,000 computer is something that most medium-sized firms can do for a $800,000 computer, not so much. And I expect we're going to see that. What we probably won't see is uh, the quantum equivalent of what we're doing now, which is you know, a quantum Mac in my case. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, quantum computers do things in different ways than classical computers, and they wouldn't necessarily improve on things. So the the one little story that everybody tells about quantum computers is if you tell a quantum computer to add one plus one, the answer will not necessarily be two. two. Um, and so the answer may not be true, which is also true. Um, and that's because it's statistical. So, um, you know, what you get is not 14, you get 1.974 you know, whatever, probably actually a lot more accurate than that. Um, so they're not, I mean, one that's lined up as something against quantum computers because, you know, it said or well, uses a, a quantum computer if it can't do something that the 12-year-old can do in his head. And the answer to that is, um, well, we've got other ways of doing it. Lots of 12-year-olds, one thing. Um, so it is a very specialist computer intrinsically. Um, but I would be very surprised if in the next 10 years we don't have quantum mini computers, meaning devices that go into data racks and data centers, racks and data centers, um, or ones that medium sized firm. And suddenly the market expands from, you know, uh, people online people online and hundreds of thousands of potential to millions uh, and the market become well, the industry becomes a whole different thing. Very true. And in, you, you talked about the fact that you can't just use a quantum computer because you need to build the model. Um, I would love to learn more about what that entails because if with normal computers we have programming languages that we can use how do we create a, a program for a comp quantum computer well uh the number of aspects to that um you know programming for classical computers is every uh is uh is very mature as an industry it does change hmm. um uh so i mentioned that when I was at high school, I programmed something in Fortran. My 30-year-old daughter doesn't know what Fortran is. Um, and it does change. My wife is a statistics professor. So she spent part of her summer at, uh, and my sort of age, and 
and um, she spent, spent part of her summer actually learning R. R is a program that's specifically designed to um, program in for statistical applications. And she got an A plus in her course. Um, so she's very pleased and she'll go back and teach the students that, but R didn't exist three, no. four years ago. So it does change. Um, the languages for quantum computers are still at a very early stage and people are working out what the market is looking for. Um, and, uh, you, you know, um, the obvious companies have some very high powered people working on, um, programming language that, that they can brand, uh, the one that pops into my head because of my personal acquaintance with it, not, uh, is Quizkit, which is, uh, IBM's program, uh, 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 Microsoft has its own program, which I don't remember the name of. Um, and you're going to see more of this. Um, it, you know, what the, the graduate students and postgraduate students are doing in labs are using machine code and things, but they can, and they did back, you know, 60 years ago. Uh, and that's obviously not going to cut it going forward. And then there's, of course, building models, which is a skill set all of its own and doesn't actually have that much to do with quantum per se. Um, but, you know, to get much past, I mean, you know, to do a, a model of the, of the atmosphere to discuss uh, climate change around, you actually have to know a lot more about meteorology and climate change than you do about computing, but somebody has to put it all into a language that you can feed it into a quantum computer. And by the way, and then I'll shut up on this topic, but um, the uh, finding somebody who is a really good quantum employee um, is very hard to do because what you want is someone who's a computer scientist and a physicist and an expert on pharma or uh, finance or something. So it tends to be teams, but because the, the specifics of the disciplines that people need to be experts in are so different, um, you know, getting people to talk to one another is, is challenging too. And that's where we are um, at our conferences. And there's one coming up, by the way, in October on cybersecurity. Um, we always have a panel on, on workforce issues. And they're always the same issues. You know, how do we find people um, who, aren't, who aren't quite Einstein level, who know enough, and, and then what is enough, and how do we get them talking to each other? And I'm not sure we've ever come up with an answer, but it's, easy, it's interesting to explore it. Mm. But this will, this will change because that sort of thing does. Yeah, and I, I think with technology like quantum computing, the promise is so massive, but at the moment, the commercial application isn't there. So people with really good programming skills, for example, can find great employment working as, as data scientists for in, in, in artificial intelligence, which is much more... <laughs> mature in terms of technology and for me we will see parallels to the development of that sort of technology because nowadays you have cloud computing you can have you can design an ai program by simply talking to a computer that will then turn your ideas into code so hopefully in the future we'll have something similar for quantum computing and we will i i mean you mentioned ai and uh although i don't know much about it anything about it really quantum computing is being applied to ai mm. uh, you are of course right that it's very ai in, in many ways is a very mature discipline although what constitutes ai has changed a lot mm. um, so actually from the university of manchester i was going to do my phd in ai and that was in 1967 <laughs> so uh, it's it's a while ago um i'd also say talking about my alma mater that uh, when I went to Manchester to do math, it was the only university in the UK uh, that had an undergraduate course in computer science. I mean, it had math. Um, 
and and we really didn't have much to do with it. It mm. didn't seem like computer science had much to do with math. I mean, it didn't effectively. So we've come a long way. I mean, the, in UK, the uh, uh, the national computing system is in Manchester, and that's why. That's why the, I mean, that's where a lot of the computing development in the 60s and 70s actually happened. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, we're at a very early stage. And if, um, uh, I mean, the exciting thing about it to me is uh, the breakthroughs that are likely to happen. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, and the world is quantum computing's oyster. I think I've mixed up lots of metaphors there, but, but, um, it really is, and what I said before, that if you're in classical computing, lots of good reasons to be in classical computing, but um, uh, if you're looking for massive breakthroughs, ain't gonna happen, man. So, um, you know, uh, just little breakthroughs. Uh, so that, that's the excitement. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And as I said, the promise is amazing. And the for me, the parallels that you talked about, the workforce issues, they are very similar to the field of AI data and data science, for example, where, where a few years ago, people were talking about unicorns that have subject matter expertise and the coding skills and so on. And, and I, I think we need something similar in, in, in quantum. Um, other than the workforce issues, what other challenges do we need to overcome to make quantum computers more mainstream? So, um, well, as long as they stay in the uh, you know, supercomputer realm, maybe making them mainstream is, is not quite the word, right word because supercomputers aren't mainstream. But, mm -hmm. but taking what you said, um, there's a whole set of issues around uh, stable qubits. Um, you, when you make them into physical things, which you have to, otherwise you can't compute. You're just, you're just writing equations and proofs. Uh, they, the qubits have to stick around for you know, more than a nanosecond. And we don't quite know how to do that yet. We try new materials new ways of encoding information. Um, qubits are, are uh, a bit reliable, unreliable, sorry, in that sense. And um, that's where a lot of research is going. Um, we're now engineering our quantum computers on the assumption that our qubits aren't very reliable. Um, so there is a quantum computing heaven where we have uh, quant we have qubits that are just as reliable as bits. Um, you know, if you could look inside, if you could do a, uh, and look inside and see all the programming language like you can in the matrix or something, you'd see that everything mostly goes according to plan. I mean, it doesn't when you have smoke shooting out of the computer, but it's it's kind of linear in a in the metaphorical sense mm. uh with quantum computers um it's it's a bit it, I, i've never thought of this before but you know why bugs and computers are called bugs and computers but because in the earliest days uh bugs used to get into computers and they break down because of some stupid fly but um i don't think flies make any difference to quantum computers but it's like that that it's mm -hmm. very unpredictable and and um um all that has to be sorted out and we don't know how to do that yet and and the economics are quite apart from the engineering of it the economics isn't well that's a big deal too i mean i think your your original question is sort of what's going to happen and what do we have to solve and i think that's another problem what the economics mm -hmm. of all this really is because at this point um, I, it's unfair to say nobody cares because of course they do. If I'm, uh, if I'm a ma senior manager at IBM and IBM, the guy from IBM quantum shows up at my office and said, you know, Hey John, can I have another $2 billion for IBM quantum? It matters to 
to John, but that's not the point because if he does grant the $2 billion, he isn't expected to see a penny back for it. Uh, but eventually it's going to become a product and there'll be a, talking about jobs, there'll be somebody called a, um, you know, a continuum, uh, which is what Honeywell used to be in, in quantum. They changed their name. Um, quantum computer salesman. Um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, again, don't believe it's going to hit the desktops ever, uh, but I'm not certain. Um, because, I mean, the applications don't seem like things people would want to do, but um, who knows? Yeah, interesting. So I guess one of the topics that people start talking about quite seriously is the challenge that quantum computers could potentially break today's encryption. So today we use very sophisticated encryption methods that traditional computers would take a million years to break if they try to try to hack passwords by brute force trying all the different uh, ways to get in the the fact that quantum com computing could potentially make those current encryption encryption systems uh, useless is pretty dangerous. And um, we also are aware that we have increasing cyber issues around the world where we see government sponsored cyber attacks. So I could very well see a situation where a country government is investing in quantum computing to hack into the super valuable data resources of companies and other governments that we feel is very well protected. Is this an issue that you see as it's well? It's a huge issue. And what I was doing when I woke up this morning was just putting the finishing touches to a report we're bringing out on quantum computers breaking into um, uh, basically into Bitcoin and other cyber currencies, into blockchain, actually, which means that it's much bigger than just cyber currencies because blockchain can potentially be used in contracts and infrastructure and things. But yeah, and it's one of those weird stories that um, happens uh, sometimes. We got unlucky. Um, so about 40, 45 years ago, the world decided to use something called um, uh, public key encryption, which means that you can pass a public key between people over long distances and the receiver uh, can uh, has the wherewithal to decode the key, but anybody who, and anybody can get that key, right? But he can't, he or she can't break it. Yeah, well, it turned out not to be that way. Um, the keys are based on uh, breaking a, uh, a number into its, in factorizing a number into its into its parts, um, and when the original cryptographers who were developing uh, uh, public key encryption did this, they thought there was no standard way to do that. Then comes a, a guy called Peter Shaw who comes up with something called Shaw's algorithm, which shows you how you can do that. So everybody can do, th you know, six. How do you break that up? It's three plus two. But when you've got some, you know, 20 digit number that uh, is actually three primes, there's no way you can do it in your head. What Shaw showed is that there is an algorithm for breaking it, which really screwed up PKI. But then uh, they came along and said, well, okay, that's too bad, but nobody could actually run Shaw's algorithm in any reasonable period of time. And you were mentioning mi millions of years. And honestly, I don't know, but I'd seen billions of years. And, mm. and then who cares? You, you know, uh, I, I have some things encrypted on my machine. If it's broken in somebody in 9 billion years, I'm not likely to care that much. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the other point is that, frankly, I've got a lot of stuff in my machine that you know, I'd happily ship to you and you'd be very bored, you know, bring a cabbage home, darling. Um, <laughs> um, but obviously there are very important things. Um, but then it turns out that what might have taken 9 billion years and pick your favorite number, um, can with a quantum computer sufficiently powerful 
be encrypted like now. Uh, we don't have such a quantum computer and uh, the estimates of when it would appear is anything from five to, well, five years to never really, that we'll never get there. Um, uh, I'm, depending on how you look at it, an optimist or pessimist, I think it'll happen sooner rather than later. It certainly isn't going to happen before five years and it might not happen before 10 years. Uh, and I have a bet in with somebody at the Rand Corporation that it, because he thinks it'd be more like 20, but we'll see. Um, uh, and, but the threat is now, um, mm. for instance, uh, the average life of an aircraft design is, is 30 years. Um, I'm told, um, planes. Um, so if you want to steal the plans from Boeing's, uh, latest and greatest, maybe you do it next week, you know, go over to Washington state and break into a building and take these. There's nothing you can do with, but 10 years from now, that plane design may have 20 years of, of life left in it. And you'll have a cyber computer, I mean, a quantum computer that can break into it. So this is a real problem. And, um, I, I didn't write the report that I was finishing editing this morning on cyber currency, but, uh, there is a lot of ways, and I don't think I'm competent to talk about all of them to break into, uh, uh, you know, uh, break into your bank account and, and steal your cyber currency. And that, that's, that won't do. I mean, that's kind of why people have cyber currency in the first place. There are a couple of approaches to dealing with that. One of them is, as I said, it's almost an accident that we went with public key encryption. So there was a, um, it'd been an effort by a lot of companies, but especially by NIST, uh, National, National Institute of Science and Technology in the US to develop actually just classical ways of encrypting things that are very hard to break with a quantum computer. And they were awarded uh, a number of awards uh, to the firms that they thought had done a particularly good job of it. And that just happened, happened less than two weeks ago. And that was big news. Um, and that's called post quantum encryption. Mm. Um, and of course the world could have happened a different way. Uh, and we could have chosen a difficult to break thing anyway. Um, it's a bit like Y2K, you know, why or why did we do it that way? Um, uh, the difference being that Y2K didn't turn out to be too bothersome and it's a one-off issue. Um, post, I mean, um, Public key encryption is uh, is a big issue. The other way is to use quantum against quantum, which is that the channel that car carries the public key can be protected um, quantum by quantum technology. So if you break in, basically the key disappears because it's in quantum form. Um, and um, uh, that's called quantum key distribution, which makes sense. And if it's done correctly, and we don't quite have the technology yet to do it correctly, but if it's done correctly, uh, then it, it's the most secure thing that's ever been built. But like I said, we've got some more technology development to do before that happens. Very good. One, one other topic that you I, I've heard you talk about is the quantum internet. So a, a computer network that can send quantum information between machines located across the globe. Do you want to explain a little bit more about what this is and why it matters? Well, you defined it pretty well. I, I think that's exactly what it is. It's, it's a way of shipping um, quantum states wherever you have the quantum internet. So it's, I mean, Conceptually, I suppose it's a little similar to the internet. Um, it would have to be comprehensive in that access and everything else is, is quantum, not digital. And we're a long way from being able to provide that. At the moment, uh, for the most part, these are test beds around the world. We just completed a report on that actually uh, months ago or something. Um, and a lot of them are small test beds in almost every part of the world. Um, the technology that they embody uh, is QKD, quantum key distribution, which I mentioned for the most part. Um, but uh, there are different levels of sophistication for that. Um, and um, 
there's a professor at uh, University of Delft at Q, the Q, Q, QTEC Quantum Research Institute. Her name is Stephanie Weimer, and she did an amazing paper, two papers in, uh, in Nature uh, five years ago, I don't know, um, uh, in which she defined the stages that a quantum internet would take, and that basically their levels of security uh, so it would be the world's most, most secure information. Um, it would be, at least initially, between big, I mean, it would be connectivity between uh, big um, uh, quantum computers, mostly, I imagine, in uh, research institutes um, and, and big companies and things, which, interestingly enough, parallels exactly how the, mm -hmm. the internet developed. Uh, we have, we can build as many test beds as we like, and it seems like we are building as many test beds as we can. But the big problem with it, well, I mean, one problem is finding what the applications are going to be that make sense. But the big problem with it is long haul. Um, you can't, partly because qubits are so delicate, you can't ship them over thousands of miles. At the moment, the only way you can do that, and the Chinese are doing it, is um, by turning them into electronic signals, boosting them with an you know, electronic amplifier, and then um, uh, then turning them into qubits again, because uh, they essentially become insecure the moment you turn them into electronics, um, because they're just as vulnerable as any other kind of electronics. So you have probably a physical building, but it might be a box of some kind that uh, is a trusted node um, and you protect it as much as possible from interlopers. And my understanding is in China, that's a, a small building with armed guards outside, which sounds like China, but isn't in the spirit of, of quantum. And, and there isn't quantum at all, obviously. Um, what you need and uh, hasn't been developed yet is a quantum repeater um, mm. and that's a major scientific problem um, because you can't amplify a quantum system uh, that's uh, that's impossible actually it breaks the laws of quantum physics so either quantum physics is wrong or you can't build a quantum re uh, amplifier so these things called uh, quantum repeaters that nobody knows how to build and interesting, they're not even repeaters in the way that telecom talk about them. We don't know what they're going to be. The uh, analogy for me, at least, I've been told this isn't a good analogy, but I like it. Um, in fiber optics, uh, you know, everybody got very excited about fiber optics as a transmission medium I mean, long between, long before quantum computing. Um, and it was originally just literally a toy, and then it started getting over used over a few miles to connect up switches, but nobody really could think of ways of, of, um, of uh, oh, I know, connecting London to New York or even New York to Philadelphia um, until someone had developed an optical amplifier. <clears throat> and that took quite a while. And it turned out you could build a thing called an erbium doped amplifier, which didn't cost very much. And suddenly we had fiber optics I mean, I was complaining at the beginning of this conversation that, uh, um, you know, here I am out of my little Virginia farm and I can't get fiber optics to my door. Um, and, you know, 20 years ago, that would have produced poor you because nobody else has it either. But my one of my colleagues in Richmond, not so far from here, has had it for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So you can see how a breakthrough in quantum repeaters could change the world. Um, again, the limitation is maybe we, we don't have that many applications for shipping, uh, qubits around the world, but we probably will. Um, yeah, I, I think in, in the future, we'll be very similar to what we have as the internet today that could lead to many new breakthroughs. Well, exactly. Um, you know, we keep talking about applications and we should, but, um, you know, part of the answer to that is should be, um, you you know, name ten applications and and I name three, and then four, five, six, and 
seven, eight, nine, and ten is I've no idea, and neither is anybody else. And and but somebody will come up with it. Who, by the way, whoever discovers a, a workable quantum repeater, or the theory behind one, is going to win the Nobel Prize. Mm. So what are your, if we look into the future, what are your hopes or predictions for the future of quantum computing? So I hope, in no particular order, one I've mentioned is that we have quantum mini computers, they won't be called mm. that, um, because I can see these spreading to um, people who, uh, you know, aren't Goldman Sachs kind of thing, or aren't the University of Harvard, Harvard University's, you know, bioengineering laboratory. So it, it gets spread around a bit. Mm -hmm. And the way that that should happen is either through lower cost quantum computers, which will come, I'm certain about that, um, or and or, through better access to quantum facilities. Because right now you still have to go through electronic facilities to get to your quantum computer. And the, you know, the terminal at the other end isn't particularly quantum. And we're nowhere near that happening. You mentioned clouds. I mean, that's essentially how you get into your quantum computing. It's not the end of the world, but it's not particularly secure. Um, so I think that will begin to happen. I mean, it's a, uh, um, it's a, uh, um, I mean, it's almost inevitable. Um, I don't believe in historical inevitability, but you can see the past history and how, why it might go down very similar paths. Mm. By the way, the other application we never mentioned uh, is very real, but we just don't know much about it, is the intelligence community and... Um, uh, and the military, but particularly the intelligence community. Uh, they certainly did have some of the very earliest quantum computers, but, um, and they've said enough, or the vendors have said enough to know that much. Um, you can guess how many they've got, uh, but you can't really guess what they're doing with them in any specific way. But, you know, that's a significant part of the market or was until very recently. But, you, I, you know, whether it's 5% or 50%, I wouldn't really want to guess. Yeah, yeah that, that was my question about the concern of, of maybe government and intelligence organizations using it to, to break codes that we have at the moment. And, yeah, absolutely. Well, they will. And, mm. um, you know, that's a separate set of issues on which I'm, you know, not particularly expert because there might be certain circumstances in which you'd say, hooray, they're heroes, and there might be certain circumstances and say, you know, the second coming of the Nazis. <laughs> and that's a very interesting question, but has nothing to, I mean, it's one of those things about technology. Technology isn't inherently evil or, or, or anything. So depends which, I mean, frankly, it depends which side you're back. So. Very good. Were you, were you um, about to say any more hopes that you had other than making yeah. it more? Uh, making it more available is definitely the number one hope. Uh, obviously, some of the applications we talked about are ones where you'd like to see breakthroughs and that probably aren't going to come without quantum computing. Um, uh, so I suppose drugs and materials are, if I, I mean, you're asking me to pick things. Uh, drugs and materials seem to me, mm -hmm. um, drugs for obvious reasons, materials, because they really do affect your quality of life in important ways, mm -hmm. uh, reduce costs of things. Um, I'm involved with a number, I'm actually a director of four different companies involved in new technologies. This is the one I'm most, but uh, another interest I have is 3D printing. And now people mm -hmm. are beginning to 3D print homes, small homes, but you could see how that could revolutionize things for people who don't really have homes. Uh, <laughs> You know, it might not be as magnificent as the one I'm sitting in now, but it would be a home, not a, mm. you know, a hovel. So I think uh, materials and drugs in terms of just well-being and changes for people. Very good. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for, for taking the time to speak to me. This was a, a fascinating conversation about a topic that we will hear a lot more about that has yes. 
huge promise, a technology that could potentially transform many industries. And I would be keeping a, a very close eye on, on this technology in the future. Um, anyone who wants to re-listen to this conversation, head to my YouTube channel or my podcast. Or, um, and also, the, you can find hundreds of other amazing conversations there. Or have a look on my website for um, articles on the topic. And if they wanted to learn more about what you have been writing about, where can they find out more? Go on to www.insidequantumtechnology.com um, and you'll find information about our latest conferences. You'll find papers you'll but when you go right on it you'll be in the middle of a new site so you'll find out what's been happening in the last 24 hours we've always got new articles up there we have a full time we have a full time and not so full time journalism staff it's not just taking things from other things so you'll get a very good representation there are pod our podcasts with leaders in that particular industry um gee what else have we got there's our list of reports that we put out which you need to buy um and uh, I know I'm leaving something important out, but everything that's quantum is up there. Perfect. Thank you so much. This was a, a real pleasure. And hopefully I will speak to you again soon. I hope so. Thank you. Sure.